قد يأتي المبنى من دكتور إفرام يلديس الليشانا عطوراي. Now we have a presentation with the full professor Afrem Yildiz, um, a professor of uh, Hebrew and Aramaic studies in the University of Salamanca. Please welcome. Shalom aleichem, ya haftab shena parat aleichem. It's just to welcome you in in our Maratang. So and I will go uh, ahead with the with the conference in English because there are many people who probably have also some other inconveniences, especially for honor guests. And that's why I'm going to do it in English. The, uh, as you have seen in the information, it was just a general, general uh, title which was given in the information. But my aim was to talk about the necessity of a phenomenon that is just, that has been mentioned how can we keep alive our language, which is the main mean of uh, identification process. And I have been working on this topic a long time ago, and I have been also looking at the possibilities, how we can um, convert it in a professional way that our young generation is not only fluent in speaking, but also understanding, analyzing, the language in itself. Uh, my, uh, during, uh, I'm following a kind of, of uh, PowerPoint presentation, but I'm going a bit bad in order to clarify some terminological uh, definitions, Aramaic, Assyrian, and so on. Why we do call our language this and that? Because each time we are together, we, we, we have this problem, this inconvenience. I don't know why I hear this from there. Uh, so uh, let's, let's go back to the even fourth millennium before Christ. When Europe came in touch with the Eastern world again after many centuries, they started defining our language according to their schemes. Hmm? We have a branch of Semitic languages, like we have a branch of Indo-European languages or Uralic languages. So, the, but the Semitic, lang Semitic language structure has been, in, re in reality, it's, it's the fruit of a, of a work which has been done in Western world. We were always lazy in that sense. So, but some inconvenience have been created according to the sources that came to us. These den denominations, for example, we have a proto-Semitic language from which we have three main linguistic families. We have Northeastern Semitic family, which is Akkadian, from which then two main languages or dialects came, Assyrian and Babylonian, which have come to us through the cuneiform script. Okay? Then we have a northwestern uh, Semitic branch, which is Aramaic and Canaanian language. Aram I will then uh, develop the Aramaic side. The Canaanian one, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to simplify it, okay? It's much more complicated, but, and then, because I'm just trying to give you the traditional division, which is based upon in certain way, a geographical division. So, Mesopotamia is northwestern, uh, northeastern. The so-called Syria and Palestine is northwestern, Aramaic and Canaanite. From the Canaanite came then down the Hebrew, Phoenician, Moabit, Elamite, and so on. And then we have a third linguistic group, which is southwestern one, which is Arabic and Ethiopian. This is the simplest way of telling you how the Semitic linguistic family is divided. Okay? So we are in Syria, Palestine, and Saudi Arabia, uh, Arab, 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 uh, Enzal, and Ethiopia. Kush, as we say in, in our language. So now let's come back to the Aramaic language. I think to speak about only one Aramaic language is, in my opinion, a mistake. It's 
a linguistic family inside a branch, a, a main branch. There are different Aramaic languages, whether we want or not. There are many people who speak it in a different way. That's, that's only as, as, a, as a slide. Just tell about we as seems we, we became, uh, I'm coming to talk about it, we, we became Aramaic speaking people too. Okay? Like the Nabateans, like the Mandeans, like the Arsacids, like the, the Mandeans, Ma, Nabateans, Palmyrians, and so on. This is why we have five huge periods of language. When I speak about periods, I mean these periods are based only on the written uh, transmission. It's not based on the oral transmission of the language. So, if we, we talk about the Aramaic, ancient Aramaic language, it's more or less, depends, there are two opinions, two uh, thousand, hundred or 11th, 10th century before Christ until the 9th century or even 8th century. This is the ancient part of the Aramaic language, which is characterized by different dialects, would I say, which start from Aram Geshur till Kue or Arpat or Patina or Bidzamani or Bid Adini and so on. So these are the different Aramean states that were afterwards totally observed by the Assyrian power and Assyrian society. So they were absolutely also uh, assimilated as a social phenomenon in the Assyrian society. But what happened when, when the Assyrians came in touch with these Aramean groups? And they were, m many of them, they were deported in the Assyrian heartland. The reason why today we call our language sometimes Aramaic is due to this fact that those who were deported in the Assyrian heartland gradually, you know, the Khanaid, as we, we say, zona zona, it became as a second language and then it eclipsed indeed the Assyrian imperial one as mean or medium of communication. That's why when, when the Achaemenid uh, uh, power came to, to the power, they didn't change only the language and the administrative system, which were just used as a common mean of the society. That's why we shifted, and there's no other simple rhythm than the following. Imagine our, our ancient language is written in cuneiform script. Uh, Ninab is here very senior. He knows a lot uh, about this topic. At least 613 syllabes you need to write you in your original language. And if you compare it with other 22 letters or consonants, which then became 27 and at least 20, 29, Imagine, honestly, if I ask you, what would you choose? 613 to learn or 22? This is the main reason why the Aramaic script became also a Syrian script. During centuries, it was called a Syrian script not by us, but by the Jews, who were settled in Babylonia. Then, when when uh, Western world came in touch and they rediscovered all what they discovered. So the structures were based on this doc uh, documents, sources and so on. And that's why we, we have this problem. What are we going to call our language and this and that. That's why I'm using, probably I'm going to use sometimes Aramaic, other times, depending on the period, Assyrian, other times and so on. So according to this uh, five, this ancient period is ancient Aramaic, and then we have a uh, imperial Aramaic, which started even during the Assyrian power. Then it was developed during the Persian time. This is the imperial Aramaic, which comes down till the Greek uh, invasion, 
at the 4th century before Christ, 330, uh, 334 BC. From then on, there's another, another phenomenon we have uh, to, to, to consider, which is the split of, this, of the Aramaic or Assyrian language in different separated, isolated sections. That's why we are, from then onward, we, we, the language is divided into Western and Eastern. The division has become so hard that the Western and Eastern is also based on geographical uh, division and so on. And then we have a um, uh, middle, a third, and a late, as fourth, and the modern as the last. So these five periods are still there. And now the question to us, well, how are we going to call our language? Is Assyrian, of course, those Assyrians who speak Aramaic language, we could say Assyrian Aramaic, no problem, I don't have any problem to call it. But do, we should not confuse the linguistic denomination with the ethnic denomination. This is the biggest problem the Assyrian community is facing with. So, I'm not going to enter in these details. As ethnic member of, I'm Assyrian. My language is Aramaic. It's the Israelis, they, they are Israelis, they speak Hebrew, and they don't have any problem with that. They don't call it Israeli, but they are Israelis. So, we should not waste energy and time on these <coughs> discussions, which lead only to the divisions. We have to unify. We have to try to put the forces together. Now let's let's go to the main point, which I was. Uh, how, how, how long do I have time? Okay, I'm going to be short. And Nina asked for other ten minutes, but I'm going to ask for other five. So this is. Uh, my, my concern is not only to regain the territory, but my concern is to maintain my identity wherever I am. And the best way of maintaining the identity is the language. A people, a nation, without its own language, there's no chance. But we are facing with, with a reality. We are living in diaspora. Immigration to the Western countries. Uh, Susan Gustin mentioned it in a very clear and nice and mm, professional way. She was impressed seeing that there are groups who are maintaining the language. But let's be also honest, she sees it as an outsider, I see it as an insider. This being fluent in two languages is well done. Are we prepared to, be, to, to teach or to transmit this tradition to our kids, this is my concern. Being fluent just in, you know, uh, saying the basic of a language, the main phrases, uh, the daily life is not enough. Because with, with gradually it will become less weak and so on. What we have to work on is, this experience has been developed in the last time, is how to prepare a child who is fruit of two worlds, Western and Eastern. How to transmit him not only the main basis of the language, but also the culture, also the history, and so on. That's why I, I said it's good to arrive to the level to dream in the same language. Uh, let's go let's to, to the other one. Yeah. That's okay. It's, there are different, different theories upon how one can become bilingual, fluent at uh, a level, second, third level. I'm going to jump because we don't have time, uh, enough time. Go to the, to the group identity and the bilingualism, the next one. This process is very important to, to, to deal with. We have an, a huge experience in the past. We were the first bilingual society. <laughs> so, the bilingualism is not invented, I don't know where, but it was used as a natural process. And that's why even the coexistence of different societies 
led to a new phenomenon that a society which was monolingual became bilingual. We had Assyrian kings that were totally bilingual. Let's skip to the other one. This is what, what the, no, next one please. The process of bi bilingualism application to the Assyrian in diaspora. This is, this is what we should work on. This is what should concern any Assyrian family. And also Assyrian leaders. Because we are not, we are, yeah, we, we try to transmit the language. We try to transmit also a heritage, but it's not going to be enough. Why? Because the process which is applicated, I think, if I have been in, in France, in Belgium, in Germany, in different, in the USA, it's even worse. I'm sorry for, for those who come from USA. Because they think as first language, the local language is logical. But what, 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 what's, what is needed to, to fill both languages as their own? And this is the point we have to work on. Uh, I, I, I can give you an example. Yesterday we were talking about uh, this process. And I applied to my own kids. This is not a theory. I did it. Till my son was seven years, he didn't know that I could speak fluent Spanish. But I realized when he started going to school, he started having a kind of complexes. Let's <coughs> uh, to the other one. Yeah. My son, I, I told it yesterday, as he said, that when he started school going with his uh, friends who were, who were Spanish, that, that from here onward, don't tell me in my language. And then just a slide of light came to my intelligence, you know, as a professor, that I failed there. I was so concentrated on the language, 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 I didn't give him other uh, elements through which he could feel as an Assyrian. Traditional uh, elements, aspects, uh, proud historical points. I gave the example of having a horse in the heart of uh, Kala uh, Palace, which is an Assyrian, isn't it? so the identification process through the language, but giving them images. Symbols, <coughs> positive symbols, not telling them, I haven't told them until they were just 15, 16, about the genocide. Because this creates a kind of, we are still, we are having an inferiority complex in the society. I'm not going to give him more uh, ways of becoming much more complex. So this is also a duty of those who are dealing with linguistic, social, cultural aspects that they have to work out. How to transmit those elements through which the kid of three, four, five, six, till he becomes adult, can feel proud. Let's jump to the other one. So what must we do? This is exactly what we have to do. It's to transmit them those uh, elements to the kids at the first stage. Then we have to look for, for other, um, how do I say, means. Human resources, investment <coughs> on human resources, educational projects, schooling materials. This is an important point. Look to what a Nina on the side is doing in, at the Cambridge University. This is a huge work. You should support it. Educational pro uh, projects. There are so many ways of building. We assume, generally, or I mean all branches, we, are, we have the habit or even a kind of, of inconvenience. We complain. We cry too much. And we have good intention at the same time. 
But with good intentions, we are not going to succeed in our goals. We have to put on the way those ideas which are really worth a, a work. And these projects should be absolutely supported by the community. We can work, but don't forget, I do it because I love my people for the first year. Secondly, I do it because I feel it as an obligation. Third year, I'll become tired and I will have a look to where to go and to feed myself and to wear. We have brilliant uh, uh, stuff, human resources, but you don't care of them. They are totally abandoned, like, like Elio. You know how, what a sacrifice did this guy in, in Trabdi? I was with him. And it was the first time I felt proud, but on the same time sadness. Because he was alone. And these aspects are your duty to cultivate, to support, but not in a merciful way. Just ask for mercy. I, I'm, I'm tired to ask for help as a mercy. It's sure it's our obligation to support such initiatives. Look, the Mara uh, project. They have been doing a huge mm, mm, work. And I, I'm realizing that it's going to die if you don't support it. And so on. This financial support for the creation of many teaching seats, institutions, this is the dream I have started with, without any help of you, in a very silent way. And I'm not going to tell you, I don't need to tell you that I have done this and that. Please don't, do not mis misunderstand me. But we can do many things. But if you don't use the public resources, the public universities and so on, the project is not going to have the results we are looking for. So we have to use, as I, I told you uh, yesterday, I started from zero. It's a state university. It's one of the four oldest universities of the world. From zero. When I came, there was only a biblical Aramaic course, a semester course. Now you have, I'll, I'll, talk, I'll tell you about it. European universities. We are in Europe, but we don't use all the possibilities that we have in our hands. Okay? Europe has adopted a totally new system, educational system, which has gathered all the systems together. We have uh, 4 plus 1 or 3 plus 2 study plan system, 240 ECTS credits. This can be done in Spain, in Germany, in Sweden and in every European country. We should concentrate our attention in those centers where there is a Semitic uh, long study tradition. And if you see, we have different universities where the language is taught. But we should, we should be uh, conscious of fact when we talk about Semitic languages, the modern Aramaic part is absolutely ignored. Besides a center I'm going to tell. Why? Because we don't have people prepared in at a, an academic level. Everybody means he knows the language well, if he reads correctly, uh, if he analyzes the language, and that's all. This is typical liturgical tradition that we, we have from Tobonoyo to make a pushaka in order to tell the community what we are reading. This is not enough. And uh, everybody means, it means if he is a deacon, he is perfect in the language. This is not enough. That's why we need professionals who are able to make a comparison between the ancient middle, late, and modern language, in order to recreate, in order to purify. You know how rich your language, my language is? But you use, we, we, we are used to use much more loan words from Turkish, uh, Arabic, Kurdish, Persian, and now 
German of the community who is living, uh, Swedish and so on. They are coming in. This is a process of, you know, coexisting. So this is not a very me, but if you have a word, hmm, your own word, you should put it. I'm not against the loan words. It's, it's a sign of living together. So according to this, uh, next one, please. Yeah, this. According to this manner of thinking, I, I started making a kind of study plans at the University of Salamanca. We are collaborating with the Semitic tradition, but now there are two, um, two fronts where Arabic language is pushing in a, in a direction and Hebrew and Aramaic in another one because of you know, uh, strategies of every uh, typical university process. Why are they, they fusing? Because of economical reasons. No other reason is given. What is not, if you invest and you have losers, you are not going to invest in it. But in the human resources, we should not deal in this way. But what, 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 what makes me a bit, uh, what gives me some concerns is our Assyrian community in their different branches are not concerned about how to help in an intelligent and efficient way those centers where really the language is kept and is cultivated. This is why we have to look for the 21st century's possibilities. <laughs> Not just living with the past tense. Past tense is, you can't forget it, but work on it, improve it, challenge it, get wider in the sense of using the language in this sense. So we have a whole process of combination. Just please go to the other one. This yeah, now let's go to the Spanish universities where I manage well what is being doing in that or in that university. We have, for example, uh, in the Semitic environment, uh, studios Semiticos and Islamicos. Semitic and Islamic studies, who are supported in a wonderful way by different Arabic uh, countries. Universidad Complutense de Madrid is one of the biggest and they have also Studios Semiticos. Universidad de Barcelona, University of Barcelona and Granada, they do have the same Semiticos. And degree, according to the new European uh, Bolognian law, we started creating the Grado and Studios of Sierra Meus, where a huge amount of courses upon language, go to the other one, please. Language, literature, history and literary texts are given and prepared. Yeah, just as, as, a, as a slide, uh, uh, if you to go to the next one, because uh, the ideas from a linguistic point of view are a uh, term, but when I use it in my classes, I, I use it as it, it deserves. So we have a whole structure based on our language, starting from the ancient till the modern one. We have added to that, uh, if you see, lengua rameuna, this, uh, this is an official study plan. It's not my invention or the fruit of, of our getting, get, get this is approved by a state. An official title is given to this. This is what we started with. We have a second step where a master is given, and then those who want to continue with him, they study, they are arriving to the doctorate. Next July, we are defending first uh, dissertation up in the studies of the Nisabin school, the school of Nisabin, at a doctorate level. So, the same aim is, we have three or full language courses from the ancient, and the last one is the modern one. Um, I, what I manage is the suited one, so that's why. Uh, could you could you please give me uh, uh, the book is in is in my laptops. Like, I forgot it. 
what we have been doing is not only to give the course, but we have to provide them also with the means. You can't say, okay, I'm teaching you, take your notes, and that's all. So that's why, since we started, I started uh, uh, writing a grammar, a very practical grammar, which uh, has or contains the script, the phonetics, the morphology, the syntax, and a huge amount of bibliography, references. It's certain in Spanish, because I thought all my students and my kids first, and the community, a single community, which is huge in Southern America, is being translated into French, and hopefully, I hope that the CN community will contribute funding it for the English translation. This, is, this has come out uh, last year, at the, at the end of the last year, and it's used as a manual for, for our students. So, what do I want to transmit here is we have to work in an efficient way. Efficient way means providing all means that are needed for a well and profound preparation of those aspects that you are dealing with. And for me, they are language. Go to the last one. So we, are, we do not only give language, linguistic, literature, history, but we give also traditions. How can I teach the, the Aramaic language to, the, to a foreigner without telling him, as first step, who were the Aramaic speaking cultures or people? This is why we have a whole semester telling about how many people were, became Aramaic speaking cultures. One of them would live with the Assyrians. Then, if I don't tell them what delicious plates we have, how we were in the ancient time, how our traditions are, the language is, is going to become a bit, um, how do I say, only theory. That's why we added also an Assyrian tradition or Keldo Assyrian tradition course. You have to tell them why you dance hand by hand. This makes part also of learning a language because it's this is the way to see your manner of thinking from inside, not as an outsider. This is the manner of seeing how the Assyrian community thinks and reasons and lives. If the language is not applied to a reality, it becomes just a kind of theory. I'm finishing, just a minute. So now the question to you, and the question to every Assyrian soul around the world. Are we supporting as it deserves the Assyrian question in reality? We shouldn't be so negative. <laughs> this is just, this is the question now. We should not only work on different lobbies, politics, but we should start from the basis. The basis, whether we want or not, if we want to be realistic, is language. And then we can build up in that part. So there are different centers who are working in a silent way. Now, probably you know, uh, imagine the huge work has been uh, done at the Cambridge University through Nineveh and the staff who is working with him. Such a stuff must be supported not only by word, but only by means. MANA project. They have collected a huge amount of documentation which is not studied. You should find out to find free scholarships to work those works now not uh, going to Susan Gusen and telling her, is there any German interested in this stuff? So, you want being Ghana and Beganan, which was yesterday. This is also part of it. Do, do you want to, to become a real people? Start by yourself. Don't look to the foreigner's mercy hand. We have learned this. this, this. And it's, it's, it's a kind of, of 
distraction because we look always what the others are going to do for us. But with the language we can do it by ourselves, especially the modern one. Thank you for your attention. Sorry. Bessie Marava, Simarava, Player Madanka.